Good morning. Yes, thank you for braving the ice and snow this morning to be here. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalm 24, verse 1. Um, this is one of my favorite Bible verses, and I think it's the Bible verse that encompasses our vision here at New Hope Church. At New Hope, we believe that we see God's truth and know God's truth in the Bible and His truth in creation, which complement and enhance each other. And only by studying both books can we begin to know God's vast love for us. So this morning, we're going to look at both books, and we're going to seek to find God in the great outdoors. When you think of the great outdoors, what first comes to mind? Is it a favorite camping spot, a hiking trail, a bike path, a walk by the river? What comes to mind when you think of the great outdoors? And when you think of that place, how does it make you feel? And who do you think created that place? All of our senses are engaged when we experience the great outdoors. So this morning, I want to explore how we see, hear, touch, smell, and taste God in his creation. How does God speak and communicate to us through his creation? Uh, recently, as a part of my seminary training, I took a spiritual temperament survey. Uh, this test is uh, based off a book written by Dr. Myra Perrin, Discovering Your God Language Styles in Seeking and Finding God. And she describes one's spiritual temperament as simply a God-given preference indicating how someone best and most naturally loves and serves God. While personality temperaments identify our preferences with people and the cosmos on a horizontal plane, a spiritual temperament identifies how we interact with God and the spiritual realities on a vertical level. But unlike other mere preferences, when we neglect our spiritual temperaments, we often feel dry and lifeless spiritually. Now, there are a variety of ways that we love and serve God and communicate uh, with Him. And so there are nine categories of spiritual temperaments. And what I found out was my top three were the all tied for first place, the caregiver, loving God through serving others, the contemplated, loving God through reflection and adoration, and the naturalist, loving God through experiencing Him out of doors. And Dr. Perrin gives the uh, describes the naturalist as the person who feels closest to God when surrounded by nature, coming alive in God's natural splendor, and experiencing an increase in awareness of God when you're in His beauty. So I wasn't surprised um, by my spiritual temperaments. I do agree this is how um, I love and serve God and how I feel He communicates with me. I feel I experience him, experience him more fully in these ways. But it was the naturalist temperament that made me think of our two-book vision here at New Hope Church. This vision is what's drawn me to be a part of this community. It's why I love this community. And I would guess that there's some of us here this morning that share this natural temperament some of us in this community that are drawn to this vision because of our naturalist temperaments. And what's so great about speaking on the great outdoors is that there's a an abundance of Bible references. So as, as I was preparing for this message and reading many of those verses and passages in the Bible and trying to discern um, where God was speaking, I found I kept coming back to the beginning and so I'm going to read Genesis 1. And as I read it, I would just ask that you see where you resonate and can live into the goodness God has made. Um, it may evoke memories of times you've experienced God in creation. And so I just ask you to think of those things while I'm reading 
Genesis 1. And I'm going to read from the message this morning. Genesis 1, heaven and earth. First this, God created the heavens and earth. All you see, all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. God spoke light and light appeared. God saw that the light was good and separated light from dark. God named the light day, he named the dark night. It was evening, it was morning, day one. God spoke sky in the middle of the water, separate water from water. God made sky. He separated the water under the sky from the water above the sky, and there it was, and he named the sky heavens. It was evening, it was morning, day two. God spoke separate, water beneath heaven gather into one place, land appear, and there it was, and God named the land earth. He named the pooled water ocean. God saw that it was good. God spoke earth green up, grow all varieties of seed-bearing plants, every sort of fruit-bearing tree, and there it was. Earth produced green seed-bearing plants, all varieties, and fruit-bearing trees of all sorts. God saw that it was good. It was evening. It was morning, day three. God spoke lights come out, shine in heaven's sky, separate day and night, mark seasons and days and years, lights in heaven's sky to give light to earth, and there it was. God made two big lights, the larger to take charge of the day and the smaller to be in charge of the night, and he made the stars. God placed them in the heavenly sky to light up earth and oversee day and night to separate light and dark. God saw that it was good. It was evening. It was morning, day four. God spoke swarm ocean with fish and all sea life. Birds fly through the sky over earth. God created the huge whales and the swarm of life in the waters and every kind of species of flying birds. God saw that it was good and God blessed them. Prosper, reproduce, fill ocean, birds reproduce on earth. It was evening, it was morning, day five. God spoke earth generate life, every sort and kind of cattle and reptile and wild animal, all kinds, and there it was. Wild animals of every kind, cattle of all kinds, every sort of reptile and bug, God saw that it was good. God spoke let us make human beings in our image, Make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God bless them. Prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge, be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Then God said, I've given you every sort of seed-bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit-bearing tree, give, given them to you for food. To all animals and all birds, everything that moves and breathes, I give whatever grows out of the ground for food. And there it was. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. It was evening, it was morning, Day six. God's handiwork is so very good. His presence is encompassed in every aspect of creation. His abundance is life-giving. We are so blessed. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, writes, the first step in the study of nature is reverent observation. We must begin with an awareness of seeing what's around us. In a world caught up in what we make, in what our accomplishments are as humankind, which although they are very good, we must never forget how it all began. Learning to see God through nature, through his creation, can help ground us, center us, and give us a proper perspective 
of who our Creator is. Dostoevsky in the novel The Brothers Karamazov counsels, love all God's creation, the whole and every grain of sand in it. Love every leaf, every ray of God's light. Love the animals, love the plants, love everything. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in things. Once you perceive it, you will begin to comprehend it more each day. Once you perceive it, you will begin to comprehend it more each day. The more we love God's creation, the more we can begin to perceive God, our maker. Love opens our hearts to learn from and to be compassionate towards God as revealed through his creation. By love, we're more likely to realize his creation as a gift. So has anyone ever asked you, what is your happy place? Where do you feel most at peace, most joy, most holy you? One of my family's greatest loves is camping. In fact, with the nice weather we have been having, <laughs> other than today, um, we're starting to get the itch. And although we have a baby due in June, I'm not sure how much we'll get out this year, but it is one of our greatest loves, and we're already starting to think about it and plan where we want to go. Both my husband and I grew up in northern Ontario in a city called Thunder Bay. This is a picture of it here. Thunder Bay is located at the top of Lake Superior. Um, it's a forestry town. Some of its landmarks include the Sleeping Giant that you see in this picture here. Uh, we have a beautiful marina. And essentially, we grew up in the great outdoors. So when we talk about camping in Thunder Bay, we talk about going to our camp, which for Albertans and most of the, I think the rest of the world, is a cabin or a cottage. I don't know why we call it a camp in Thunder Bay, but we do. And I was blessed to grow up at our family camp, this is a picture of it here, um, at Birch Beach on Lake Superior. And this is one of my most treasured happy places. My fondest memories as a child is having breakfast by the lake. I would sit on the black rock, which was readily being heated by the summer sun, and listen to the waves coming up on shore. And this is the black rock there. There were always birds, usually seagulls, singing a morning song. And the air was always clean and fresh. Taking deep breaths between my hot chocolate, chocolate, I would rest in the calm that surrounded me. Even just seeing those pictures now and talking about it, it's like my shoulders drop, feel such a sense of peace and calm. This is a place where I feel God, where I feel him holding me, his arms around me, and him saying to me, you are loved. It's in those moments all my senses are awakened to his marvelous creation. Psalm 23, verses 1 to 3, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. In the evenings at Birch Beach, the moon always seems to be very high in the sky, and there's always a path of light from the moon across the lake directly to our camp. And every time I would stand in that place, um, I was reminded of the Bible story of Jesus walking on the water. In that moment, in that path of light, I always felt like I could do the same, like God was drawing me to himself, not in a morbid way, just in a very present way. God is there through that soft moonlight. He's letting me know I'm not alone, 
He's letting me know that he sees me clearly. And in those moments, I always see him clearly too. God made two big lights, the larger to take charge of the day, the smaller to be in charge of night, and he made the stars. Do you have a place like that? A happy place that brings you closer into the presence of God and his creation, where all your senses come alive and you perceive God more fully and more completely. So, 14 years ago when we moved to Calgary, I'm sure you can imagine it was a bit of a culture shock for my husband and I, and our camping changed quite a bit. And I think for the first couple years, we probably just really counted the days till we could get back to Thunder Bay for our couple of weeks holiday at the lake. But eventually, we did decide to embrace uh, the beautiful creation that is here in Calgary and that surrounds us, and it, and it is beautiful. We just had to realize that in order to get to the lake, it wasn't going to be a 30-minute drive. We were going to have to spend an hour or two or three to get to our final camping destination. And we also realized that a lot of uh, campers here bring their camps with them in the form of an RV. Now, when we started camping 14 years ago here, um, we were students, so we opted to start tenting. And we would fill our Toyota Corolla with as much as we could for our mountain camping. And we started by going out to Banff and Kananaskis. And then our friends introduced us to a place called Kukanusa, which was just outside, or is just outside, Fernie, BC. I would say that's when we became very serious about camping. We even upgraded to a tent trailer at that point, which was very exciting. <laughs> so two years ago, there it is right there. That's our home away from home. Uh, two years ago, on one of our camping adventures at Kukanusa, we found heaven on earth and my second happy place. God met us for a week in the back country of Kukanusa, way off the beaten path, where we could camp right on the lake. Again, just talking about it and seeing our trailer, and it just makes my heart well up with the beauty of God's creation. Psalm 98, verses 7 and 8, Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. And that's where we camped for a week. There's one night in particular that stands out for me. It was a very windy evening, but it was warm. I was getting a bit frustrated with trying to talk over the wind and hold everything down at the campsite, so I decided to go into the trailer for some shelter. But I opened up the screen and I laid on the bed and I just looked out onto the water, which you could see for miles. And the wind whipped through the trailer. Although it wasn't violent, it was actually quite peaceful. And it was warm, as I said, so it was, it was quite nice. And I laid there for a long time. God's spirit was moving across the face of the earth. And I felt in those moments like I had the privilege of sitting and basking in his glory. All you could hear, feel, smell, taste, and see was the wind. And looking back, it was actually quite a rejuvenating experience. So Birch Beach and Kukanusa are two of my happy places. And as my spiritual temperament suggests, it's in nature that my spirit is recharged and made whole by God's spirit. It's in the great outdoors that I often more readily find God than in other places in my life. Is there something about being in nature that allows me, that allows us to find God more fully? Or is it just how I'm wired? Possibly how some of you are wired. When we go camping as a family, or decide to spend the day outdoors, hiking, biking, gardening, skiing, my husband's an avid skier, 
I'm technically unplugged from my busy life. And I mean literally unplugged. I'm out of range. My cell phone doesn't work or it's turned off. I can't surf the net. Instead of living in cyberspace for a few hours or for a few days, I'm living in God's creation. I'm tuning into God and who God has created me to be. I'm refocusing my attention. I often find this place to be quieter. It's usually in these places where I feel I finally have time to think, to be present in the beauty that surrounds me, to be in the world that I take for granted on a daily basis. The world that I often don't observe reverently because I'm staring into the world of my technology instead. Now, I'm not saying technology is bad or not necessary. It, too, is a part of our creation. But if we go back to what Dr. Perrin says about spiritual temperaments, it is good to remember that when we neglect our spiritual temperaments, we often feel dry and lifeless spiritually. So when we neglect ourselves that quiet time, when we forget to unplug and rest in God and his creation, there's a greater chance we will feel dry and life will feel tedious and flat. Just like our phones and our computers and our technologies, we too need to be recharged. We have permission to do that, and it's necessary for our survival. And I don't stand up here today telling you that I'm great at doing that, but it's when I'm in those happy places that I remember we all need to do that, and we have that permission, and it's necessary for our survival. Speaking about survival, there is something I haven't told you about these happy places. I love camping, love it, but it's also the place of my greatest fears. I am terrified of wild animals such as bears, coyotes, and cougars, all of which have been lurking at some point in our camping adventures. My fear is greatest at night when I can't see what's around me. But what's interesting is that this fear doesn't stop me from going camping. It's not what I think about when I think about my happy place. It's, I'm really only aware of this fear when I'm living it. When I'm in the tent trailer and I hear the coyotes screaming across the night, when we pull into a campsite and there's signs all over about how the bears have been spotted, keep your food in your coolers, in your cars, whatnot, or when a camper comes up to us and says a cougar has been spotted a few miles away, women and children shouldn't be al left alone. So comforting. <laughs> But when I think about camping and our adventures, those are not the things that first come to mind. I'm only aware of it when I'm living it. But isn't that the case with so much of our life? Probably most of our life. We're often unaware of God's good creation until we're living it, until we're in it, till we're, til we're being present to what's around us. Even as a naturalist, I'm often unaware of God's good creation. The busyness of life is real. The responsibilities take precedence. But the great outdoors is such a good reminder to us. Nature is the pointer to the truth that God can only be known as we live in him. God is not something we include into our lives. He, we're included into his. Before anything came to be, it was a thought in the mind of God. It's a paraphrase from Abraham Kuyper, theologian. God is the creator. This is his creation, and he blesses us with it. I don't include Birch Beach and Kukanusa into my day. 
I enter into it, into its presence, into its being. When we take the time to reverently observe God, his creation, when we love nature as a gift from God, and we let go of the control we think we have in our lives, we can more clearly see and know God and humbly bask in his abundance, in his creation. So what I've come to realize is that both in the moments of fear and sheer joy in those happy places while I'm camping, God is present. On one hand, God's creation makes me rejoice and praise his holy name. It's overwhelming. But on the other hand, it humbles me deeply. It makes me realize how fragile I am. And it causes me to depend on his safety and his security. And it's in the balance of love and fear that I experience God's creation so full and so complete. Psalm 16, verses 1 and 2, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. So, with the better weather coming, it is coming, this is spring, summer is around the corner, we will all be experiencing the great outdoors. Even if we're not naturalists um, by heart, we just will naturally be spending more time outside. And so, in those times, I would encourage you to reverently observe your surroundings with both love and fear in order to perceive God more. I dare you, I give you permission to unplug, even if it's just for a moment. Catch your breath, recharge your spirit in the goodness of God's creation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> hmm. Heavenly Father, Thank you that your creation is so good, so very good. And thank you for blessing us with such abundance. Help us to see more clearly and to reverently observe your creation and you as our maker. Bless us and keep us this week and this morning as we continue to worship you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>